go to a show without someone calling me a pussy for dodging Fabio and me trying to grab him around the neck in the crowd. He, he took me to school. I can't lie. The, the bench alone pitch with me in the push chair. <laughs> yeah, it, he's definitely 1 0. The same with David Adelaide? Or a little bit different? A little bit different, a bit of a prick. But I would definitely enjoy knocking him out. Get a bit more out of knocking him out than I would Fabio, let's put it that way. I got bottled and then I was punching and. I remember like security coming over and I am like, but you've been stabbed and I'm like, oh. Hello and welcome back to One on One Boxing with me, your host, Rob Tennant. As always, I'd like to remind everybody to please like, comment and subscribe. Turn your notifications on for more boxing content. Now that's out of the way, welcome back to another edition of One on One with, and this week we are joined by none other than Big Phrase, Mr. Fraser Clark. How are you, Fraser? All right, my mate. How are you? I'm very well, thanks. Very well. Thanks for coming in today. Uh, you, you got in nice and early, which was good because usually I have to wait around for, uh, for Will Harvey. Um, so you're a good influence. That's it, mate. You know timekeeping something I hold very dear in my heart and I'm usually okay with it to be fair you are actually aren't you because I mean, I've come down to the gym before and it's something that's been shared by uh, your gym mates you're always there you're always making sure everyone else is there on time apart from Richard React Paul um, <laughs> Rich is like it's, it's timekeeping just I don't think he owns a watch well he definitely does but he doesn't look at it it's just one of those things where you get like it's just the, the blingy watch and he's like, it doesn't actually want to yeah, tell the time he never looks at it no, but no. Thanks very much for coming in. Obviously, we're gonna we're gonna talk about a little bit more general stuff today. So we're not gonna focus too much on kind of your pro career today or you know what's coming ahead. But let's talk about your last fight uh, because it was a significant one in your professional career. It went ten rounds for the first time against Marius Vac. Uh, Please with your performance. Yes and no. Um, I think it was one of them. You know, okay, but can do better. Do you know what I mean? Definitely. Like it was a. It was definitely a welcome to professional boxing. That was the, that was that was realistically that was the first fight I've been in, um, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the ten rounds. Don't get me wrong; like it taught me so much. I've come I've come away from that fight a better fighter. And at this stage of my career, that's what I need to be doing now. Like, there's no point in going into the, into a fight and coming out having learned absolutely nothing. You know, you do the training camp for a reason, and you learn in the gym. But it's also good to win and learn under the lights and, and I thought I did that how hot was it I don't know I, I, I'm not like to go on about it that much because I feel like people are, are using it as an excuse for a bit of a sort of laboured um, un, un energetic performance but we know in the lighter guys the fitter guys are even saying it like you know, like they, they were coming back to the change room. And, oh my God, Fraser, it's hot out there. <laughs> oh, and I'm thinking, oh yeah, like it's hot in here, mate. It ain't gonna be that hot out there. But I walked out and the, the, like, the noise, obviously the York Hall, you know the atmosphere, the people, the body heat that was in there, plus the heat of just like being a green ass, it was sweltering. And, I'm, and I mean that like, the, my gloves, I've gone to put them on this morning, uh, the Everlast, the, the they the just ran, the, the colour just ran all through the glove, like I was dripping that, like <laughs> never before. But like I said, I, I don't want you to use that as an excuse, but yeah, it was definitely difficult um, conditions to deal with. Do you like boxing in your call? Yeah, I box there loads of times, yeah. And, and, and yeah, I like, I more like the the um, the area. I like fighting in East London. You know, I think there's a like fight week is good because you sort of get to walk around. Obviously, I was there. You nip down the Repton and, and have a look at there. I should show my friend, look at this history of this club. Go and have a look around. We went up Brit Lane. Then you go to the Blind Beggar and the, the craze and all that. So I really enjoy boxing that, that way there. And everyone's knowledgeable about boxing. Like we went to the cafe one morning. And go, oh, you're crazy. You're boxing. They started talking to me about the history, who they'd watched boxing at York Hall. So in that sense, yeah, it's great. But in terms of, um, you know, changing rooms and, and air con, it's just non-existent, is it? Yeah, it's um, yeah. I mean, even for me, and I obviously only have to walk around at a very leisurely pace with a camera most of the time. Yeah. I've been there. It's always a always an experience going to watch boxing in a, in York Hall. Do you remember the first time you boxed there? Yeah, first first time I boxed there was was a loss. I boxed Joe Joyce in the ABA final. Twenty twelve. Twenty twelve. Yeah, and um, I think second round I got a thumb to the eye and. I can remember the referee like stopping it once and let me go on again, come back and just similar to uh, remember like when Joyce fought the bar, the yeah, eye yeah. just went closed. Mine was it was just huge. You know, there's a, there's a picture on Google of it somewhere. It's just like me with hair and with just this huge <laughs> black eye. It actually um, cracked my my cheekbone. So I can remember after that there was like a period of probably about six months where 
anytime I, I sneeze or anything, I got a black eye. So I had to get like, complete rest. But um, yeah, I've had loads of, other than that, I think I'm, I'm unbeaten in there. So I think I've probably boxed in there about eight times and I've lost that one. But yes, yeah, it's a great place. What's the dream boxing venue for you? I think Madison Square Garden would be good for, for the just for the history, but just because of the lad I am and probably because of the film The Hangover, our deal <laughs> is MGM and then stay out there with a week for a week with my friends and just just go crazy. I was gonna say like you mentioned The Hangover, you have to you you, you have to got a box out there. Yeah, so you have to box have first, first and then yeah, okay. and then just then just go cray out there yeah were you out in uh, New York for Joshua when Joshua Box Reads no I didn't go there that was great That's probably, people ask me about like best um, atmospheres um, and obviously 258 but it was a loss it was unfortunately not a mm. not a positive experience for Joshua but that was brilliant like the acoustics in there it's sort of like like York Hall or one of the I mean we did Royal Albert Hall fairly recently as well it's one of those places that where looks it, good actually it looks really good but it good. sounds great yeah, like yeah. as soon as you hear like a ripple of applause it's like oh this is brilliant and like Madison good. Square Garden's very similar it's not a bad seat in the house as well so yeah. that's always a good one to go I know we just we mentioned then about oh it wasn't a great experience for Joshua do you I have a question to you mm. if if he didn't have that defeat in that then do you think he would have still been unbeaten now obviously he fought or do you think do you think do you I, I actually think and people talk about oh no he's he's got rid of his confidence he doesn't trust in his chin anymore since that fought. I actually think it was a bit of a blessing obviously it wasn't a, wasn't ideal but I, I think it definitely made him I still feel, I think he's a better fighter now than he ever has been I know you hear all this stuff about his being gun shy and everything but I think he's a better fighter now than he had a, than he would have been if he'd walked through Ruiz, because I think that was the the start of the change in him. People say, "Oh, it's bad because he's gone gun shy and this and that." But I think he's a better fighter now. If you look now, I think he's a better fighter now than he was before the Ruiz um, Ruiz fight. And if you look at the performances against Usyk, I think I know he lost, but they definitely it definitely shows that. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting one. I've spoken about this a few times in the past because you've seen like Lennox Lewis when Lennox Lewis was stopped and how that kind of revamped his style and changed his style. Vladimir Klitschko, like they're the two like most obvious examples yeah, yeah, yeah. of heavyweights who kind of changed and used the loss really to sort of propel a second and sort of even third really in Vladimir's career like stage of their development. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing for Joshua. I was like like you, the Usyk fights. While he lost Usyk, I didn't think he should have fought Alexander Usyk. Uh, which is something that I was uh, the, quite the, the first one the first one yeah. I, I, I understand why he did and I got all the respect in the yeah, world same. for him for doing it same but, but. I, can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, can, I can remember I can remember a very influential person at the time saying listen just give the belt up you know you want it give it up don't worry about it we can go elsewhere but listen there's there's a certain fighter in, in some people and I do respect it you know I, I respect that he, he took it on twice 20, 24 rounds with Usyk, like, mm. and remember, he, he got a good share of the, the second fight as well, mm. you know. So, and it, it was kind of what we were saying as well. Like, I didn't think, um, I thought he boxed well in the first. I know, like, everyone says about like it was the wrong game plan, it was the wrongness. I didn't necessarily think he was capable for nine, ten rounds. It was a, I had Usyk winning the fight, yeah, but, but was, I didn't think he was capable of boxing with him for nine mm -hmm. or ten rounds. I thought mm -hmm. maybe first three or four rounds, and then try and physically impose himself yeah, after yeah. that. But having the kind of the wherewithal and the smarts and whatever you want to call it, even from a negative point of view, some people say, you know, he's stubborn and he wanted to box him, mm. but wanting to do it and actually doing it are yeah, two very yeah, different yeah, yeah. things yeah, with yeah. a guy like that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it's an interesting question. Would he have ever been able to beat Alexander Usyk? I think based on what we've seen so far, I'd probably say no. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's fair. always a hard, he's a genius. You know better than me, mm -hmm. like watching him through the amateurs mm -hmm. and what Usyk's capable of doing. And yeah. You know, that style, I think, is always going to be a problem for somebody like Josh. It's a problem for anybody, isn't it? I think he's a... Who wins, Fury or Usyk? At the minute... Probably Usyk. I, 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 just, be, just because he's active and he seems to be fighting a lot more. I think I think more than anything, I think he's, his sole focus is becoming... Unified champion of the world, undisputed champion of the world, mm. you know. And at the minute, I think Tyson, his heads, I'm, his heads are always there. Do you know what I mean? Like we never know what he's thinking. That's that's the beauty of him. We don't know where he's at. He, he could be solid in training camp, head down, everything. But he might just be showing us something else. But at the minute, I'm hearing all this talk about Ingarnum and stuff, and I just think it's distracting. You know, in terms of 
if you're going to fight an, another really, really competitive fighter. Um, on his day, obviously, Fury can get in there. He can whoop anyone. But I'd say the momentum is such a big thing in that division. And at the minute, I think Usyk's got all of that. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and I think, like, I had this conversation with somebody recently. We haven't seen, I don't think, anyway. I know Fury's won three fights since. But I don't think we've seen a, a stellar Fury performance since the Wilder rematch. Think about the third Wilder fight. He was down twice, the second of which I didn't think he was getting up. I thought he was stopped in the in the third fight. Obviously, he got up, won by stoppage. Then he boxed Dillian White, which I think was a very, very good fight for him, stylistically. I feel like yeah. that was always going to go the way that it went. And then, obviously, Chisora, you know, you'd already seen the, the two previous fights yeah. where Chisora had with respect, you know, more left in the tank since then and Fury wasn't quite where Fury had, had kind of grown to. So I don't think you can take an awful lot from those two performances. Whereas Usyk's obviously had the two wins over Joshua and he's kind of the more in format of them, yeah, that, I think. That, that's what I was getting at more than anything. But like I say it once again, you know, like, is Fury, is he just blagging everyone? Mm. Is he just blagging everyone? And is he in a really, really good place? Because what I do respect from him is, he, he's gone really quiet, you know, on the socials. Obviously, you're heavyweight. You want to see what Tyson Fury's doing. I have a look and he puts the odd thing here and there, but I just think he may be in a really good place and just keeping it sort of to himself. But obviously, like I say, it's distracting all the Ngannou stuff. And yeah. obviously, we want, to, we, want to, we, we want to see him fight Usyk, don't we? Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm the same as everyone else. I'm a fan. I don't know why they can't get us agreed, but I think, obviously, we've still got like half the year left. I'm hoping for the Brits, obviously, boxer, match room, Queensbury, just to, to pull it out of the bag and, you know, keep give, keep our reputation going with solid, solid domestic and world-level fires. Yeah, because we had, like, a nice little purple patch, didn't we? And when I say purple patch, it lasted for, for a little while, where kind of, you know, everything we had stadiums and we had all the fights, even, like, that period of fury going over to Vegas yeah, and boxing like, over there. Yeah, that's unreal, like... But it started to go, not quite, I think transitional stage is kind of what people have been discussing, isn't it, over the last 18 months or yeah, so? Yeah, because, remember, we lost, we lost, a, not lost, a lot of senior pros have yeah, retired yeah, yeah. you remember they're like the ones that were selling out the stadiums and I had this conversation with Tony Bally on Sunday um, the stadium fillers aren't what they was five six years ago like you just Froch Bellew Kelbrook just just Groves, just, just Kong, Groves Kong, yeah, just to name Frampton, a few Fr see yeah, yeah. they've all sort of obviously moved on uh, to retirement or or other things so I think it is a transitional period. Now we've got people coming through. Like I went to Cardiff. I've seen Cordina fill the stadium there, and like that's looking good. Dalton Smith winning the other night, you know. And then we've got other people coming through. Adam Mazine, Josh Boatsy, and Nicole coming to coming to boxer and Sky. So it's like it's in the transitional phase, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to take a few good breakout fights for for people to you know. Ten thousand used to be when I was doing the security. Ten thousand used to be an average number. I'd say you know in them stadiums. All the time, you look. You look if you get three or four or even yeah, five yeah. Now at the minute. So I think it is definitely in a transitional phase and phase. And with the um, with what's going on in the in the world, with obviously the money crisis and stuff, and and the wages and everything like that. So let's hope we get it back and fill these stadiums for boxing again. Yeah, there's a few different things I think that have kind of contributed to it. We've had the pandemic. We've seen you know Matchroom have left mm -hmm. Sky Boxer, a kind of new outfit, and yeah. have come in and obviously kind of built a stable over the course of the last. 12 to 18 months it seems like to me and look this is something that you have very real experience in recently it feels like at the minute because we're in this transitional stage we've got like bt is going to be tnt and you've got like the zone kind of disrupting the market sky looking to consolidate but it feels like because of all of those things that there's more political boundaries and divides than there ever yeah, has been it feels like to me it is there's a lot of splits you know between obviously i'm a fighter but i'm also a fan and i'm also surrounded by loads of fans everywhere yeah. i go i meet boxing fans and some people have some people have still got their, their loyalties to like matchroom they go to the matchroom shows but obviously they've got the now fans of some fighters on sky and i think people are split but you know because there is that many different places to go and watch boxing and and we also have in this country now we all have some really good small hall shows that yeah. get put on so it's a lot of money as well you know like a, a night out for boxing i always say this you know once you've got your your accommodation your ticket everyone's buying a new rig to go in you're talking, it's a 500 pound weekend, you know, for a lot, a lot of people, it's not the case of turning up and buying a ticket and going to watch a boxing, yeah. the beer money as well. So I think with everything we've just spoke about, 
people are just torn on, on where to go and, and who to watch. The good thing is there's a lot of it. Um, the bad thing is, obviously, it tears a lot of people in. With the clashing dates, people are doing a lot of clashing dates. Oh, my minute. God. It's, like, it's minute, like, we had, like, that eight, uh, end of May, wasn't it? Where was it? May that, 27th. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, there was three shows on that night. The next week, there was nothing. And despite what people say is, we're not bothered about this, we're not bothered about that. There's a ratings war. There's, yeah, there's a they might war. not be there bothered is. about it, but the people above them and the people is. above them, they're quite bothered about it. Um, how much of boxing, like, you know, I know that you're a boxing fan, but for people who are watching, maybe not as, as kind of clued up, I guess, how much boxing do you watch? Are you kind of, because sometimes I'll speak to fighters and, and they're like, oh yeah, I don't actually, yeah, I just sort of box, it's my job, I don't really watch it and things like, are you that or are you, are you, are no, you I'm, something I'm, else? I'm, I'm, I'm heavily invested, Good. like, an annoyingly invested to like, the, the missus, like, I, I go, I go, People know. Probably slowed down a little bit, actually, since the whole Fabio kerfuffle, and it was starting to get a bit annoying with, I couldn't go to a show without either someone someone calling me a pussy for dodging Fabio and me trying to grab him around the neck in the crowd, or uh, me getting interviews, and it was just a, the constant topic. But I, I'm at a show every, probably every other week, you know, mm. if, especially the pro shows, amateur shows as well watching it on TV obviously and then having to having to catch up with the American stuff that's going on the American small halls which which is kind of hard to get you know unless you've got a dodgy stick so um, yeah I'm heavily invested you mentioned that about um, we won't really, not going to spend too much time on it but the whole Fabio Wardley situation was that your first kind of I know you've been around the sport for, for mm -hmm. many many years both as a participant obviously security and kind of knowing fans and, yeah. and fighters and, uh, and what have you was that the first time you kind of it was like a bit of a like mini baptism of fire like welcome to the yeah, program yeah, this yeah. is the, poli the political side of things and kind of get to see that underbelly of it but rather than seeing it or witnessing it third hand or second hand from somebody you know it happened to you didn't it I think so far in my pro career, I've been I've been a happy-go-lucky guy. Everyone can go and speak to Big Fraser as a lovely guy, which which I definitely am. But um, it gave me, like you say, a baptism of fire, and it's made me stone cold. It's made me. I'm immune to it now. I'm immune to the. I'm immune to the abuse online. I'm immune to like the uh, the, the the stuff of people in the street or at boxing shows. It's made me granite. It's made me tougher than ever and uh, really, really thickened up my skin. But it was difficult. There was a 10 day period where I was in camp alone. The socials were going crazy. We like, even though we didn't fight in fairness to us, we called it, we caused it, I think a national stir. Let's put it that way because everywhere I went, even people in the street were talking about it. Do you know what I mean? So um, like I said, I think it's a fight that now is gonna be demanded at some point, whether that's now or, or further down the line. I think we've put our names together and you know Fabio and, and, and Fraser Wardley and Clark it, it's going to happen now at some point but yeah I can't lie it was it was the first real people coming at me I, I was the I was the Olympian I was the captain of the team I was the good guy and then all of a sudden I was this guy that ducks the fights so I don't want to fight which is never the case and anyone that knows me knows that but um, yeah I had to really um, grow a backbone What's your, your kind of your view? Because I know I know you and I know Fabio, independent of each other. You're both good guys. You both speak very well about the sport. I, you know, from kind of the far removed position that I'm at, I think you'd get on really well. You, I think you'd be friends. But obviously, <laughs> there's a time and a place for that, and it's not now. What are your feelings about Fabio Wardley now and kind of the whole situation? I, you know what? As a as a, as a boxing fan, I couldn't be more impressed with what he's done with his career. You know. When you look when you look at his beginnings mm. to where he's at now, sixteen and over with sixteen knockouts, 15. fifteen knockouts, whatever. You know, as if I'm a boxing fan, I'm sitting there, I'm saying, bloody hell, like this guy's come from the white white collar background. It's a it's a real you can make a movie about about where he's at. Me and him, there's there's not real really a problem. Mm. Obviously, um, he's witty. He's very witty and he's good with it. And and I like to think I, I'm not too bad. I can be a bit witty myself. So. We have the back and forths when it was in the build-up online. You know, he, he took me to school. You know, I can't lie. The, the Ben Shalom pitch with me in the push chair. <laughs> yeah, it, he's definitely 1-0. He's definitely 1-0 on, on that front. But we exchanged a few messages in, in, the, in the DMs just like, you know, about the fight. He, he, he openly said to me, look, I know, I know you don't not want the fight. He goes, but I'm going to have to run with this now. I just said, listen, do your worst. A day later, two minutes later, there was a picture of me in a push chair with a dummy in my mouth being pushed by Shalom. So, you know, that's where you have to really just like, 
Yeah, like, hold your breath. I think with stuff like that, though, like, look, everybody loves just or a throw in a table, apart from the person who's throwing it at. Um, but it, that, that little bit of wit and the thing that, because that does add to it, and the fact that like, you're a good sport, and, you know, obviously it's, it's not great when you're getting a bunch of abuse from people, but I think when people can kind of see that it is kind of healthy, friendly, whatever you want to call it, competition between people, I think that's good. I think people are able to jump onto that rather than it being, like, unnecessarily go straight to a yeah, hundred, like, you know? it's not like, you know... I'm not turn, I'm not I'm not pulling up an Ipswich mm. and look looking in his local pub or see see if he's there. It's nothing like that. Do you know what I mean? It's like let's see who can gain a little probably a little psychological edge. Let's see who can give the other one like a little a little dirty elbow. Um but I've got no problem with Fabio, you know, he's, he's from from what I've seen of him and what I know of him, he's always been all right. It's just well not unfortunate. It's it's great. It's for, actually great for the sport, it's great for me and him as fighters. You you need you need the dance partner, and I think um, we've definitely f found each other in the heavyweight division, and I think I think we'll be good for each other, and good for each other's career, until we fight. Then someone's gonna come off worse, someone's gonna win, someone's gonna lose. But like I say, it's, it's, it's not it's not personal. It's it's business and it's good business. It's good business and it's good to have him because he's got such a great record, a good backstory. I've got a good backstory. My record's growing and getting better. Um, yeah, good dance partner. Same with David Adelaide, or a little bit different. A little bit different, a bit of a prick. Um, I do. I just think. I just think he thinks he's better than he is. Um, just not really my kind of my, my kind of person. Um, like I say, he said, you know, right before there wasn't really a problem with him. I see him at a couple of shows. We have a little nod and this and that. Then we had the thing with um, Tundi and uh, Spencer where. For starters, I didn't even know that was going to happen. I thought I was doing a podcast. Next thing you know, oh, we're just inviting someone else in. <laughs> Happy to be Dave Adelaide. It was always going to go down like that once, you know, you're better than me, I'm better than you, um, sort of thing. Um, but then there was the talk about, I said, I'm going to slap him. But I didn't say it like that. I just said it like, if you come at me, you know, I'll, you'll get a slap sort of thing. Um, another good dance partner, to be fair. You know, I'm, I'm definitely open to that fight um, somewhere down the line. Maybe in a not too distant future, I think. I think Boxer and Queensbury are quite open to work yeah. together. Another good dance partner, but I think it's still still not personal. But I would definitely enjoy knocking him out. Get a bit more out of knocking him out than I would Fabio. Let's put it that way. Which one's the more difficult fight? Do you think Fabio? Why? A uh, bit more elusive. A bit more un unorthodox. Um. And obviously, you just look at. I think he's, he's performed better as a professional. I'm not saying David's an easy fight, but I think it's definitely a fight which his style is suited to me a lot better. Did I say amateur too long? So the coach goes, um, I've got, got your lad from Finchley, uh, Anthony Joshua, whatever, mate, bring him down. I turn around, I'm not kidding you. He looked like he'd been carved out of stone. And I thought, oh shit. By any means necessary, I went to get that medal. I didn't care how it happened. With Natasha Jonas, she was. She was like a mother to me. I was crying. I hurt my hands. I was on a physio bed, and she came in and she read the bike out to me. I'm gonna climb the ladder again. I can promise you that. Last time, well, not the last time. I've seen you plenty of times, but we came and we did punches and brunches. Mm. Uh, would have been about a year ago. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we discussed then about uh, Moses Atalma, mm. Enrico Atalma, as we, mm, kind yeah. of, as we knew him then. Um, and I remember at the time, like you know, we hear all the ghost stories about him in the gym and going to spar this person, going to spar that person. Um, a lot of hype around him at the minute, and mm -hmm. a lot of you know, a lot of stories kind of making more public, and, and and people have got this real kind of interest and intrigue around him at such a young age of his career. How good do you think he is? How good do you think he could potentially be? Oh, he's, he's very good. There's no doubt about it. Like people, people want to want to forget about the amateurs all the time and take away from what people have done which which is wrong because mm. it doesn't get publicized but it, the achievements which myself people like Moses uh, have got as amateurs you know it, it counts for a lot and he's fantastic you know and he, he's, he's still learning obviously we all, we're all still learning um, but he's a real problem um, and I think as he matures to a man which you know, I don't think there's no shame in saying that. Like he's still still young, but he's developing fighter, developing physically, mentally. Um, you know, I think I think he can be one one of the real diamonds to come out of Britain. You mentioned that about kind of people, sort of. It's almost like 
people look at it or some boxing fans look at the amateurs as like cheating or it it does, no like it doesn't, doesn't matter yeah it doesn't, doesn't, matter. doesn't matter like Lomachenko boxing for a world title in his second fight yeah yeah but you know he did all of that amateur stuff which is just you know and like we've spoke about it in the past myself and Andy Clark where Andy Clark will sort of say like people almost like hope that pro fighters who have got like extensive amateur backgrounds kind of don't make it in the pros because yeah, oh, it's, it's different weird. and this isn't that amateur stuff it's so you must weird. get that it's so weird like I can never even to talk about it I feel like I shouldn't talk about it because then all you get is oh you're just living off that no I'm not living off it but I did live it mm. and it was really hard and anyone who who knows anyone that's been involved in it which by the way is all the top fighters in the country right now the, the, obviously you have the, the odd one that we spoke about Fabio he, he is like a yeah. the reason why the, the, there is this intrigue around Fabio and his career is because he's an anomaly like to yeah, get yeah, where he's, he's got to he's freakish like, yeah it really it's weird. is yeah. it's like it's, it's strange but like I say it's difficult. It's so difficult. The, the team's just been out of the European qualifiers and the, out of 13, three have qualified. That just tells you how, how difficult it is. Um, so I'll never not stop talking about it because it's something I'm, I'm really proud of and not just for myself. I'm proud of all the other people like that have, that have done well for the country. And people do forget that. It is for the country that we represent and we live in. So, you know, if, it, if a pat on the back isn't, isn't given, I just don't know why. And that's not just, just for myself. I don't want no pat on the back. But, some of the guys and some of the girls, you know, that have, that have done amazing things, I just don't feel like they're credited enough for it. You know, with me being, uh, obviously with Boxer and Sky now, it's something that in the next year, I really want to make a push on, on, I think I'm in a position where I can make a push on getting some more coverage for these guys, getting getting these guys more out there because coming into pro boxing is a difficult, difficult place to be in. Um, I think, you know, I think everyone on the platforms, that's myself with Sky, the guys at Matchroom, Queensbury, we've all got a bit of a responsibility to, to get onto your broadcaster and, um, you know, try and help the amateur guys out because they're the, they're the future stars. And, you know, I'd, that's probably just me as a No, no, a person, I, think it's, you know? I think it's a great point that you make that. I mean, we look, we spoke about, like, the, the purple patch in the period that British boxing had. You go right, that's like right the way back. You go to Audley in Sydney, you go to Khan in Athens, and kind of what that did to shape the next... I don't know, 20 years near enough of boxing. Uh, without that, without that amateur rearing and the Olympic success, you don't get a Joshua, you don't get a James DeGale, you don't get a Luke Campbell, Galawi exactly. Five, Fraser Clark. It, it, like, I've never met Audley Harrison, but you know, like, if I if if I did, and people have a lot to say about Audley Harrison, just a big thank you. Do you know what I mean? I think I think what he done and what he started for 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 Britain and for amateur boxing isn't talked about enough and I know I know he mentions it now and then because I think I heard, heard him on a podcast but people forget like b before that things were bleak yeah. things were really bleak and over the last sort of you know 20 years um, things have things have really got better and you know like people like the names you mentioned Khan the Gale all, all them guys I, I, can remember, I can remember being being a kid and looking at them guys and imagine if you don't have them people to look at but if you can't see them anywhere other than the GB social media or their social media, there's there's huge platforms out there that should be should be propelling these people because guess what? When it comes to them, you wanting to sign them in in a year's time, two years time, which you're gonna, do, if you were good to them, when no one give a shit, it might make things a little bit easier. So people should definitely, you know, this is not just promotions, prom promotional companies, broadcasters. Get on the phone to the people at the IS in Sheffield. Get on the phone to GB Boxing. Go and go and propel these people, because they're going to be they're going to be the people you're going to want to employ in the future. And not not just not just them. Neither England Boxing, mm. amateur amateur club shows. The whole amateur system needs something pumped into it. I've been going. To, I go to a lot of club shows, and and they're not what there was a few years ago. You know what I mean? It's dying off. Um, this is a little bit of a, a little bit of a plea. For the for the for the broadcasters for the promoters, invest not even money, inv time invest some Exposure. time. Send yeah. send the camera crew down. Let me put on let me put on the big phrase boxing tournament and 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 get get amateurs from all over the country, open class novices. Um, come and come and come and film it. Send the camera down, film it, and give it give it an half an hour slot on 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 your, on your channel. Do you know what I mean? And what it does for the kids and what it do for the next generation to be on TV. To see that you know there's an interest there, it'll do so much for a lot of people. 
you got that you can see it I mean you just heard all of it. Oh, I agree with everything that you've said there's Jordan I hope you take notes on all of that stuff that Fraser was talking about we have to get it get moving uh, but you clearly have this passion for for amateur boxing and what happened you know your, your career that you spent in the amateurs with GB people will always look people will always kind of say now or well, not always so you get the kind of discerning voices and our oh, phrase he stayed amateur too long and he left the best years of himself in the amateurs I'm not gonna say something stupid like do you have any regrets of staying there? because obviously the answer would be no but how much did that process Process and going through all of that brings you not only as a boxer but as a person as well. Did I stay amateur too long? In a, I'm, I'm always honest. In an ideal world, everything could have happened and I could have been 28. So it's, we're talking a couple of years before I turned pro. If I was 28, in an ideal world, probably would have been a little bit, little bit better. But the apprenticeship that I received. And the timing, remember, timing is everything. If I had turned pro when I was 24, 25, I wouldn't be a pro now. I'd be out of the game. I'd have probably been beat, been rushed, been in hard fights. Um, not, I've had nowhere near the opportunities that I've had now. I bided my time and I waited because I've seen the bigger picture and I listened to sense. I listened to, to I, I remember I'd... I've got one of the best mentors who, who who took me through my career from from GB to to the Olympics in the world in in Ron McCracken. You know, I, I listened to that man a lot over the years. He told me to wait, told me to be patient, and when he said that, I listened. I I think I, I think I've timed it perfectly. You know, I don't think my best years are, are behind me. I think my best years are starting now because the way the division is now, you're gonna have to be matched very carefully if you're a young heavyweight. Because people are big, people are strong, and people have a bit of know-how. I, I picked up a lot of that through the amateurs. I'm having to pick a lot of it up now still, but I think it's. I think I've, I've timed it perfect in terms of the bag, in terms of experience, and in terms of moving forward. You mentioned um, earlier on about doing security at shows. I think anybody who would kind of go back and watch some of the big particularly heavyweight fights we'll see you there right there and, and seeing people like Anthony Joshua who you've been with in the amateurs mm. you've shared countless rounds of sparring are those the difficult bits when you see someone that you know and he's making plenty of money he's got packed out stadiums and the O2 arena are those bits over the years or were they the bits that kind of tempted you a little bit to maybe think oh actually I, I don't really know like Joe Joyce has now gone to the uh, uh. yeah yeah it, it was because you know like you remember you're in the gym and you're sparring with these guys you're having, you're having competitive spars yeah. You're having, and you think, well, if they can do it, I can do it. But one thing I've learned since turning pro, and I knew before that, doing it in the gym and sparring is one thing. Doing it under the lights and doing it well. Because remember, winning isn't enough now. Uh, the public demand more. The promoter demands more. The broadcaster demands more. The journalist and the people involved demand more. So I, I know that you know that there's a right time and. If, if I was being dead honest with myself, even when I was having these competitive spars and, and these good sessions, I wasn't ready. I, was, I, was, I wasn't ready to, to come on. I used to sit there and watch AJ, Dylan White from ringside. And I, I could beat that opponent. A joy, I could beat that opponent. It's not just beating them. I could have beat them. It's how you beat them. Uh, you, you've got to beat people well. And like I say, you know, my, look at my performance against Marius White. Not the worst in the world, but I can definitely do better. And, and it's all about recognising that I'm not the finished article I'd all, I'll definitely recognise that and I'm still a sponge still as keen now to learn and improve as I was when I first started boxing do you remember the first time you met Anthony Joshua do you remember the first time he came into the gym uh, the first time I met him I actually, I actually fought him that's the first time I met him that was 2009 November in Burton on Trent at the Belvedere Sports Club bit of a story I was supposed to box my first time boxing on my home show, quite a popular lad in, in the town, small town. Sold a shed load of tickets. I had a few fights. I think I just started boxing for England. Everyone was excited. The day before we had a pull out, um, I said, listen, get me anyone. You know, I was confident. So the coach goes, um, I've got, got your lad from Finchley, uh, Anthony Joshua, whatever, mate, bring him down. Um, so he's come and, you know, you, anyone that knows the amateur system, you're in a little room at, in the venue doing your weigh in. I've, I've got on there, probably a little, little pair of budgie smuggler pants on, gut hanging over, titties hanging down. <laughs> I can just remember this shadow coming over the back of me because obviously you're in a queue. 
Uh, I turned around, I'm not kidding you. He looked like he'd been carved out of stone. He looked like he'd just got out of the jug. And I thought, oh shit. <laughs> um, anyway, we went in there, we had, we, had a, we had a crazy fight. I can remember walking out, I walked out first, amazing reception, then he walked out and I can hear, oh. Anyway, that was that was the first time we, we met each other. Then obviously we, we went on to the squads and you're pretty much you're pretty much in each other's company every day, you know. You, then you travelled the world together, different training camps, tournaments. So yeah, I've I've got him with AJ, you know, since since I met him. So I think we had a mutual respect, and it's carried on. It's still carried on to this day. Could you ever have imagined that he would go on and achieve what he's achieved? I mean, you, you sat there with a, a two five eight management cap on. He's now yeah, your manager. Yeah, do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, man. I'm sure there's no. there comes a point where you probably thought, you know, aside from that, you probably didn't think it was possible, yeah. but. It's strange the way it's strange the way the world works and the way things work out. You know, life just takes loads of twists and turns. If you could ask me when, when he was driving around his his black ID, he had a big court case hanging over his head, um, and he was going to the amateur tournaments and, and and knocking out people and then beating really good fighters, amateur winning a world silver. If you asked me then if I thought it would have blown the way the way it has. I, I couldn't have told you it would have. I knew he was going to be. I knew the good things were waiting for him, but the way he transformed and people arguing about this all the time, he transformed British boxing. I know who had something. To, uh, I can remember Fro Fro Frotch had a lot to say about yeah, it. He didn't. He has, yeah, yeah. Of course he has. But no, he did. He did. Like when 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 it started. When he started. I can remember he fought Emmanuel oh, Leo yeah. on the debut, yeah. and I knew Emmanuel Leo from. He he had a few profiles, but he's doing a bit of WSB as well. Um, I sort of knew I was there the reaction people people were engrossed the world that the world just like the no the country just engrossed on that I'm sure I'm not I'm, I'm not sure but if you look on the, probably the YouTube viewing figures after that I'm sure it just went crazy for him and then it just grown he come to Sheffield just normal still grown and grown and grown before you know it he's a superstar they you know they did such a good job with him you know uh, between Ron McCracken and Eddie Hearn, you know they did they did a fantastic job with him in the early stage, and before you know it, it was a superstar. It feels like it happened like that. Do you know what I mean? It happened so quick. Uh, but did I have any idea it would go to the level it is now? Global superstar, shed load of money. Nah, I, I didn't think it was possible from boxing, um, but it definitely inspired me. You know, you, if you get a little bit of that bag, you know you're doing all right. Yeah, it kind of hit the perfect sweet spot, then you came through in London 2012, which was a massive, like, that was kind of like, you, I think about it now, like, the whole, I, I mean, I don't, you're around the same age as me, but I'm just about old enough to remember Euro 96. And I remember mm -hmm. kind of like what that gave to the whole yeah, yeah, country. country. And, and yeah, London yeah. 2012 was very similar, yeah, wasn't it? You had him, you had Luke Campbell. Oh, the, the stars aligned, didn't they? You know, for them guys, uh, I, 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 I've, I've watched it a few times since, you know, I can remember the... Uh, the Olympic final going to count back and thinking this is bloody close mm. mate because um, I was at the semi-final then I flew on a holiday watched it on holiday I thought this is close I didn't know which way he'd gone he got it on the count back um, from that moment there next thing you know um, he had a bit come back to Sheffield I think he had a bit of a chill time then when I seen the picture he had the picture with Eddie Irm around him in the office and the white the oversized white yeah, shirt yeah. not fitted and nothing like that yeah the, the, the sort of the uh, the blinkers were off and in, into, into stardom me went. I mean, obviously, you know, your journey was your journey and his was his, but, but you went to the Olympics eventually and it was kind of, it was it was the COVID games, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I mean, I remember staying up and watching your box and watching everybody and I remember thinking at the time, like, God, it, it didn't have that, obviously, because of the time and, and, and the place and where the world was at the time. Were you wary of that at the time or was it something that you just shut off and you focus on what you're doing? By, by that time... Um, the two Olympics I didn't manage to get to, COVID, me and me and Galal were were obsessed with getting a medal. You know, we, we were obsessed with it. I, I didn't give a, I didn't, I wouldn't have cared if the Olympics was in in a garden out here somewhere. I needed to get there. I needed to get a medal by any means necessary. I didn't care. You know, I didn't. I'd, uh, um, I did a podcast last week with that idiot TKV, and he said oh, I didn't deserve the medal. By any means necessary, I wanted to get that medal. I didn't care how it happened. Three disqualifications on the bounce, I would have took the medal. That was my sole focus to get that medal. I did not care about how, when, who. 
I got the medal. I come away. I did my job. Um, my family eat good food and live in a good house, you know. And and that that was that was the promises. And some of the some of the some of the inspirational words from some of the coaches used to be, you know, you you can put your family in a in a good position. You know, you can put your kids into a good position. I'd managed to do that. I came back with it and I, you know secured it. Do you think if you didn't get a medal, you'd have packed it in? Do you think you'd have gone pro? I'd have gone pro. I'd have still gone pro. I love boxing. Um, it's, it's just what I do. I'm, tr I'm starting to develop, you know, uh, a few other skills in life. Um, but for for majority, if I wake up and I haven't got boxing, it'd be a sad, sad day because I won't know what else to do with myself. It just would have been a lot harder. It's a lot. I've been blessed. I've been very lucky, but I worked hard for it. So no, not you lucky. Make your own luck. Not lucky. I've made my own luck. That's exactly why. That's exactly what I've done. Um, I put myself here. I went. I went to every shit country you can imagine. I got that many scars on my face you wouldn't even believe. I've had. I've had all the surgeries on on the hands, the leg, the elbows. I, I've done all that. I've done it for. I've done it with no money. You know. I've. I've gone. I've gone with that. I've seen people in in my own age go to work and earn good jo do good jobs apprenticeships and, and get the money where why I'm travelling to Slovakia you know on, on a dodgy flight staying in a one star hotel eating shit food and boxing Russian Kazakhstan Uzbekistani monsters and my, or, tricky yanks so I've done all that so I won't have anyone say I, di I didn't deserve it And uh, but now what I've had to do now is reset you, you got your one goal reset and go again my goals are set again and you know like I did with the Olympics there's going to be some tough times some ups and downs but I'm going to climb the ladder again I can promise you that yeah I think there's kind of a misconception about GB boxers that you know you are you live a complete life of luxury and you get paid a load of money and you it's all like because and I think like my, uh, you know, I mean uh, compared to compared to the club boxer it, it probably is you know compared to the the lad that's having to go to work or go to college and study run in the morning go training at night time, uh, earn money to, to survive as well. It probably is, that is luxury, but you still have to work hard to get there. And then when you do get there, you're not getting paid millions of pounds. You, yeah, you, you know, you'll see an Instagram picture of the team at the airport wait, waiting to fly out, but where they're flying to, let me tell you, some some of you, some, some people won't survive it. They won't survive the, five, to survive the week there. They'll be begging for a flight back. Some of the training camps, the conditions, the animals, the, the countries you go to where people are desperate to succeed and every sparring session is like a fight and they want to take you out to impress their coaches in order to be number one and there's five or six of them. You know, it's, it's, the luxury is you get good sparring, you get accommodation, you get, a little, you get a little bit of money to live off and you're able to focus. That's the luxury. But don't think it's don't think it's like paradise or it's this five-star wrapped in bubble wrap treatment. It's not, it's... It's literally the gulag. It's this. It's it's solid. Who was your best friend throughout the whole period of time in the amateurs, or who were you closest Ooh. to? I would imagine it probably uh, not, not uh, changed, but like, I imagine it probably changed and developed because yeah, you were there. So I've had so many squads. I think yeah. my f first Charlie Edwards, Anthony Fowler, they were like the first people I sort of hung with. Then Joe Cordina, one of my best friends, Kez Ashfak. Um, Galau Yafai, Cal Gamal, you know they they they, they were they were the ones I really really close with, but just just I become McCormack, McGray, you know Chev, Boatsi. There's so many. I was I was one of them guys. I don't think I've ever not liked anyone on the squad. Do you know what I mean uh, in the early, early days again another great fight? Ian Weaver, what fighter he was. Um, Simon Valili always always had a lot of time for me. Put his arm around me. Um, Scared the shit out of me. Bradley Saunders, Tom Stalker, uh, Andrew Selby, Fred Evans, all, all also good good friends and good crack all the time. I'd never had uh, a problem with anyone in the squad. I was always good friends, and I'm thinking now in case I've missed anyone out, but I'm bad to have because I, I've met that that many people. Natasha Jonas, she was she was like a mother to me. She, I, I honestly believe, one time in Finland after a really bad performance. I lost to a guy called Cam Awesome. He's an American yeah, 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 awesome. lunatic. I lost to him in the worst fight ever produced. It was the biggest hugging match ever. <laughs> and I, and I got back to change it. I got back in the hotel and I was I was crying. I do it with my hands. I was on a physio bed and she came in and she read the right out to me. Said, 
you're lazy, you're doing the wrong things on the weekend, you're not applying yourself in training, um, you're up, you're up, yeah, you're out with the lads in Finland fucking about doing things that I can't really say. Um, and it was a wide berth, and I, I'm de- that was probably 2011. I can remember that was that was a key figure. I'll never forget a key moment in my career. One of the talkings to that made me switch on a little bit. Really good. With the heavyweights, how because you know, how close can you be? I don't know if you, you share a lot of rounds together, but you are mm. in competition, and people always talk about like the yeah. the fine line between the camaraderie and the competition. It's a, it was a weird one because. I think with AJ, it was always like mate, like you know, like friends. You know what I mean? Because he was he was sort of we was in competition, but we wasn't. He was miles ahead of me. It was just if if it had if it had broke his leg the week before, I would I'd have got the opportunity. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But other than that, it wasn't really competition. So me and him was like we was always cool. Joyce never a problem. Always a lot of respect. Never the best of friends. Didn't really hang together, but. All the lads would go out, go cinema, or go for a walk around Meadow Hall. We'd, we'd go go for a Nando's together, like a big group of people. Um, Daniel kept himself to himself. Didn't really, didn't really engage with anyone really. But I'd always say hello, never a problem again. Nathan Gorman, say hello to him. Nice, nice geezer. The early days. I mean, Isa. He was, a, he was another one. He, that's a name. Um, a lot older than me, a bit of a scary character. You know, I was probably like 17, 18. He was a grown, like, 30-year-old man. Just completely different. But, no, there was... Solomon, so when Sol came in, we had all mutual friends. So, Chev, Ben, Galau were all mutual friends. So, never had a problem with Sol. Still haven't to this day, even though we're, you know, same same division. We've helped each other out with sparring. Really good guy. We've got, I wish nothing but the best for him unless we fight. Do you know what I mean? So... Never, I'm not that. I'm not that guy. You know, I ain't gonna. You do your thing. Let me let me do mine. If we fight, we'll fight. If we get on, we can we can shake hands after. If not, you know, we we'll go our separate ways. I, I ain't got time to have arguments or beef with people over over something. I want to see everyone do well. Have you ever fallen out with somebody who's not been GB? So like an American or somebody like that. Ever have like a, no. a, a rivalry with somebody from a different country? Well, yeah, uh, Murad Aliyev, yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously. He's, he upset, he's, you, he's upset yeah. about the Olympics, yeah. but he forgets that I whooped his ass four times before that, three or four times, and he was just he was just a dickhead, you know. Like he used to make he used to make everyone feel uncomfortable, you know, from every country. No one had a good word to say about him. He used to intimidate the women, like staff. I, some of our staff, he used to intimidate them. Just the looks, the seedy looks he'd give people. Uh, walked around all the tournaments like he owned the place. Um, who else? I had a bit of a bit of a a running with some Bulgarians one time, one time, nicked my gear, nicked my sparring gear, brand new winning set, and then nicked it. So I went in the, I went in the hotel and banged all the doors down, and and he yeah, got it back. He got it back, yeah, yeah, I got it back. The coach, the coach brought it back because you know I was in the in the hotel. That I think it was like an eight hundred pound set, gloves, head guard, protector. I had nothing. Someone sponsored it to me, and I, I cherished it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I had that I had that that winning set for a good six. I still got the head guard and protecting that. Like I've still got, I've still got the head head guard protecting that. Yeah. Like twelve years old or whatever it is. Um, so I can remember that went down one time. Uh, in Poland, me, a guy called Declan Fusco, uh, and a few others. We got, we got into it with, with some Polish and had some fisty cuffs in the hotel. A little as a couple of Azerbaijanis and Polish. Jeff Saunders, he, me, De- Jeff Saunders, Declan Fusco. He has some right mad stories, but that it just happens over the years. You know, it's it's competitive, and when you go on these trips and all these different nations, you know, you you you've got to back back yourself because if, if they see any che- cheeks chinks of weakness in in you as a team or as a person, that they're, they're horrible, not nice people. Some of them. It seems like a lot of people on GB like really relish that that kind of team environment, that team atmosphere. And obviously, mm. you were the captain of the Olympic team. That must have given you such like a, you know, such an additional layer of pride on top of all of it. When you consider the whole journey that you went on at GB, that must have made you feel ten feet tall. I think I think it's just like the person I am, but I admit I miss it. I miss miss the team thing bad. Yeah. That's one of the biggest ad- adaptations as a pro. You're on your own. You finish training. You're on your own. You go back to the hotel. You go back on your own. You digs. Um, I, I'm just proud, you know. Like, I think it's more more matters to everyone else than the captain thing. But 
unknown to me. I'd done it for years without even recognizing I'd done it. Mm. Cause I'm always there for anyone to talk to. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm captain now, I need to start like acting different. You can ask anyone, Any anyone from Team GB was fighting and I was at the tournament and I wasn't fighting the next day or that day, I was in the crowd. And that's that's whether we was close or not. I was in the crowd screaming for him, bellowing instructions, just just support you support your friends. It's just something I've been taught as a as, as a kid. I think, you know, you look after your people and um I, I can remember one of our old coaches, Paul Wormsley, you know, he'd, he'd always say, you know, make sure it make sure we can hear you. It might have a little influence. You never know on on a, on a tight decision. So I, I can remember always doing that and listen, I'm just one of the people if you're my friend then then I've got I've got you. Do you know what I mean? We've talked about the amateurs and kind of your journey throughout it. You mentioned his name earlier on, Rob McCracken, mm. synonymous with the success of, of, of GB. And I guess mm. somebody who, I think really, I, think, I don't know whether or not it's because of the Joshua kind of since Usyk won, where people were sort of, or even Ruiz won, where he's kind of, it's boxing, isn't it? It's very fickle. Where yes, people, of course it is. People just, uh, you're only as good as your last fight, but that's the same thing of a trainer as well. How much of an influence has he been, not only on you and your career and your life, but on GB and all of those other names that you've just mentioned there and bringing them through, and how much has he given to British boxing? He, I think he's got the NBA, right? Rob got NBA, I'm sure he's NBA already, but it's deserved. And he doesn't, he doesn't have social media to shout about mm. it. He doesn't. He doesn't. You see him at a pro show. You'll see him in a GB GB tracksuit with his hat down, a bag on his back. Watch his fire. Get in the car and go home. He doesn't want no attention. He likes to see young fighters come through with nothing and leave with something. And uh, like you know, I, I I just I just the wis more the wisdom, you know, because he, he he's like a normal guy like like me. He's proper had life experience. He's been in America trained. Grew up in Birmingham, see, seeing everything. Um, he's got so much experience just just in life as a person. So the influence he had on me was it's been massive. And I, st I, I day to day probably go back to some of the things he says he said to me over the years. You know, especially in in boxing terms. Um, you don't meet many of them, but a lot of them GB coaches. You know, people that just want to see you do well. No, the, he doesn't make no false promises. You know, no, not everyone's going to come to GB and leave an Olympic champion. Uh, not everyone's going to come and leave any sort of champion. But you can definitely come and you can better yourself. You know the, that that thing that um, squad offers you. So you can go to university through that squad. You can you can do. There's people that have come into that squad with nothing and left with either some ex some really good experiences or a qualification or a medal to go and to go and help your professional career or just just a good improvement in your boxing um you learn nutrition you learn how to train you learn to travel the world i'd never i'd been on a plane once before i got on gb Where once go? I, went, I went i think me and my mom and dad and i went to spain when i was like 16 you know and then to, to now sit here and say i've traveled the world that place and then people give me good experiences but rob as as a, as a whole as a man you no different no different it doesn't look down on anyone doesn't judge anyone just wants to see just wants to see hard-working people get what they deserve what's the biggest thing do you think he's instilled in you what one one life lesson if you can narrow it down to that do you think you can take away from the time of, of working with rob the life lesson don't have too many kids with too many different women that was that was uh that was that was sort of that was sort of drilled in you all the time but other than that um i think it will be just to to listen to the right people because there's a lot, a lot of bullshit is in boxing. So I think that was, um, it was always drawn into to us and anyone is, you know, everyone in boxing is out there looking to earn a few quid or take a few quid from you. So just be careful about who you trust and don't, the good thing is always said to me, don't feel, you know, I can still pick the phone up. I believe, I've, I've not spoken to him for a while. He's a busy man. I'm, I've been busy in my career. I still believe if, if I needed him, I could pick the phone up tomorrow and I think I could get some good advice off him. Mm. So I think more than anything, just be careful who you trust and who you listen to. I got bottled and then I was punching and I can remember like the security coming over like, oh my, like you've been stabbed. And I'm like, what? Can't beat these people. They're willing to do a lot more than I am. Do you know what I mean? How did you find your way to boxing? How, wh when did you first start boxing? What was the, the route that took you there? 
Um, ju- I just tried everything. I wasn't. I was just a, like all my all my friend, normal young guys, um, middle middle class, like to lower class kids that like to play football on the park, basketball on the park, rugby, whatever, basket, like anything. Do you know what I mean? So. I tried everything. I wasn't very good at everything. You know, I wasn't athletic enough. Like, I needed to lose a bit of weight. I needed to toughen up a bit. I, I watched Mike Tyson on, on a pay per view on someone who we know is Skybox because they had Sky. We didn't. Uh, stayed up and watched that with my dad one time, and just you just sort of end up there, don't you? you know, like in the first few years, you know, there's no point in saying, "Oh, you know, I, I was that dead serious," but I knew that I enjoyed it, and I knew I was better at it than any other sport that I tried. And I knew I was better at it than my mates. And because all my mates were like whippets and athletics with like little six packs and stuff, it was the first time I thought, you know what, I'm all right at this. So I'm going to run with it and carry on. And then 20 years later, I'm, I'm still doing it. It's so important, is it, for like, if you, particularly if you're that way inclined as like a sporty kid or you want to get involved in stuff like that, you find something that you think, okay, I am actually good at that. Because I think that's how, like, you know, wider point what, what kids nowadays miss out on through society is that there's kind of, there's no real place for you. And if you're not like, a mm. wonder kid 18 year old who started your own business and earned this that, and the other you're like a failure and like yeah. sport feels like it's not as prominent a part of kids growing up nowadays as it was when we were when we were younger and it's it's so important i think anyway for somebody to find something that they think okay i'm actually good at that and you start getting praise and gratification Confidence, you, man, yeah it, does, it's does so, so important you, isn't it? it's so important like and I'd, even like it's sad obviously like, I, st- I still run around like the ends i still run where i grew up Sometimes I, I run where I live now, and you know, like on a, if if I'm running, in the school holidays, I'm running in the morning. We used to be on the park yeah, from eight o'clock right. in the morning to eight o'clock at night, playing football tournaments, basketball tournaments, Codex, Lurky, all that stuff. You you said that to you go and say that to some group of kids now. They want you to look at you like gone out. Do you know what mm. I mean? Um, which is sad, you know. I can't remember used to do a thing in a holiday, sport in the hood, you know, like, yeah, like you play schemes, little play schemes and stuff, schemes like, and stuff yeah. like I don't see enough of it happening. And, and that was, that was like, that was part of my upbringing. That's part of my, my nurturing to probably the way, the way I am now, do you know what I mean? Like I'm competitive and I, I try different things. I'll try anything once, you know what I mean? I might not be great at it, but I'll try anything once. And I, I did that as a kid. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I feel, I feel sorry for, I feel sorry for the kids in our generation, man. It's, it needs a lot of people like myself, uh, and once again, a lot of people with influence to, to sort of make a change and tell, not tell, show it, give examples, you know. When my, my boy's two years old, um, he will, when when he's a little bit older, even now, when he's a little bit older though, on the weekend, he ain't gonna be sitting, he ain't gonna sit in the house and play PlayStation for 12 mm. hours. We're gonna go park and kick ball, throw, throw rocks, I don't know, do, just, do, just do things that like I used to do when I was a kid, do you know what I mean, play, Tig, lurky, hide and seek outside, you know, just do things other than sitting in inside on like Xboxes and TikTok, like, you know, it's, it's not normal. It's not that like the world has gone a little bit mad. Well, so particularly as well, because like my, my daughter's six at the end of August. So she had kind of a period in her life where she was like just starting to get used to the whole nursery thing and like engaging with other mm. kids and stuff. And then COVID happened. Yeah. And then everyone's time. like shut back into a room and stuff like that. And you kind of like, you lose the, the ability to interact. Like me and you can sit down. We haven't prepared anything today. Like, uh, sorry, um, mm-hmm. but we've sat down and we can hold a conversation where we can talk and things like that. And like, my concern as a parent is that the new age of kids, they're not really programmed to do that. Like I was the same as you mm-hmm. out all day. Every, I used to live next door to, to the school, my lower school. So I used to have like seven aside goals next door to house. So I literally used to jump in over gold, the fence. Yeah. Just brilliant. Just got in your gold. own football pitch. It's unbelievable. Literally. Whereas kids nowadays, like even my daughter, she wants to go on the iPad and I'm like, no. I mean, for a little bit, like, yeah, yeah, little, yeah, but, bit, little bit. Same as my, same. I can't say my kids are perfect. You know, my my daughter and my son, they're a sucker for. My daughter's wanting to go through either TikTok or, or YouTube. The son wants to, my son wants to play games games on the phone. He's t- he's two. It's you know, I'm not saying I'm not like completely against it. But I'm saying you have to kind like, of find, it, what, find that balance, don't you, with how the medium. world is going yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. You can't just be like, oh no, you sit there with your chalk and your your chalkboard. Yeah, of course, like, you have to be. Yeah. Work. But it was like I was happy last week. We went on a holiday, a family holiday, and uh, I was like over the moon at like my daughter. Like you know, you first get there, you get around the pool. There's she's six. There's other kids there. There's, she went and made friends. She made she made like a friend from from New York. You know, she made another friend. Some people that she couldn't speak the language. 
I said, uh, she comes, she goes, I, I can't understand her. I said, listen, like, just just use your hands, do whatever. Before you know it, she's playing with a Norwegian girl. And I'm just like, it may, like, fill me with a bit of pride, do you know what I mean? That, that she could do that. And it was a sign for me, you know what, there's, there's still hope yet, do you know what I mean? What kind of parent are you? Are you a strict parent? Are you an easygoing parent? Because I'm not at home a lot because of boxing mm. takes over. Everyone's over if you're a fighter. And so I'm like a proper pushover. What are you like? Yeah, I think I'm a bit the same. I think I'm, I'm the, f like, I get a lot of stick, a little stick off my off my <laughs> my partner for like, you know, you got me a bit, you got a bit more, bit more discipline with Trent because he's he's two, but he's like the size of a four year old and he's yeah. he's a bruiser. Um, my daughter, because obviously that's with an ex partner, so I only see her like um, like half the week or like the weekend or, or what, like she just like comes comes and goes sort of thing. So when I see her, it's like she knows I'm not seeing my dad all week. I'm getting something, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? Like we're, we're going tan, yeah. something's going down if I say I want to do this. So I I've got, I'm trying to like work that balance, do you know what I mean? But yeah, I won't say I'm overly strict, um, but, but I, can, I can be, but I won't say I am. I'm saying like, listen, like it's the weekend, let's go soft play, let's go park, let's, you know, you, you, if, you've, if you've ate well in this week, this week and you behaved, you have your McDonald's on, on an evening, do you know what I mean? You, you have the Happy Meal, we can go and sit in there, go cinema bowling like, they can do whatever they want to do you know they're good kids and as long as they're behaving with my daughter as long as she's doing well at school the the, um, the school reports are always good parents evening is always good so as long as they're doing that my son's developing well you know that they'll get treated accordingly do they do they know what dad does for a living do they understand yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mila watches like she didn't like she didn't like the one where I got caught um, she didn't like I don't know yeah, she didn't like that one she seen me in the Olympics, like, course she didn't like that. Trent, he's just, he's obviously just two, boxing, 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 uh, daddy boxing. So, yeah, no, you know, I just want to make them proud. Would you let, I say let, I mean, so your parent it is let, whatever. Um, let them box. I'd prefer, if they wanted to. Definitely not my daughter, definitely not. Um, she's, I, just got, I couldn't ever envision seeing her get, get a hit. Like, it just freaks me out. Trent, listen. I prefer him to play football. They're treated a lot better. It's golf, hard. Golf, in hard golf, yeah, <laughs> golf, yeah. So I'd prefer him to do something else. But knowing him, looking at him, looking at his character, I'm um, I'm a boxer. His uncle, his uncle fights. His granddad, the boxing coach. He he sees it twenty four seven. He, we've already got my punch bag. It's probably in, inevitable. It's going to happen. Yeah. Would you have to be involved, or would you? Yeah, want to, yeah. You know, I, how I, involved are you? Uh, like helping him, or are well, you you bank dancing behind the flag? I, I, I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen it over the years. Seen a lot of examples. Yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I've been with um, Charlie and Sonny. You know, I've, I've yeah, seen yeah. them coming up with their dad. There's a other. I'd be. I would be. The. The Grant Smith, of 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 dad, involved. But not trying to hold involve, the but if yeah. you want it, you you go and do it, and I'll help. I'll help you as much as you want. Yeah. And I've seen him do that with Dalton. Do you know what I mean? Like Dalton, like there's a really good relationship. Um, yeah, I'm never, I'm never gonna be a pushy parent, but if he's gonna do it, he's gonna do it properly. If he's gonna do it, he's not doing it like half hearted because I've seen people get hurt. If you're gonna do that, and you choose to do that. From the second you say you're in, you're in, and once you're in. You give it your best, and, and and if that's if that's winning, if that's having ten bats and winning five, losing five, or if that's becoming national champion, or if that's becoming Olympian, Olympic champion, then you do that until you enjoy it. The second you stop enjoying it, you go and you, as long as you're educated, you go and get yourself a job and, and make a career for yourself. One of the things that we've not spoken about in the past is that you were stabbed, weren't yeah. you? Yeah, um, yeah, and that was around the same time as your daughter was born. Yeah. What was that experience like? What did that do to change your? Because I can't mm. imagine something like that, you know, happening and how it would change and alter your mental state from there. What was that like? That whole process. Yeah, that was that was shit. That was a bad time. That was twenty sixteen December. Um, just like grow up a little bit myself. What happened? I was out in a club, um, local club. We'd all been in my dad's. My da oh, dad's got the man cave. Was all in there beforehand. Load of white rum, load of load of brandy. Like we was West Indian yeah, party, yeah, yeah, just like just just drunk. Yeah. Then we've we've all gone to the gone to the club. Good night. I've I've walked in. I've seen 
a group of guys I know from like the next city derby from obviously we're town there just down the road 10 miles a little bit moody a little bit moody like a few stairs and this and that and just thought nothing of it and then I think a drink got I think I knocked a drink someone's it's drink always over something yeah, stupid something like daft. it's like, it's it's like the yeah, last yeah. like 20 I think I knocked a drink out of someone's hand I'm not going to say I was pure innocent and not like on it because cause I probably was and then before I knew it like I got bottled and then I was punching and I was I was I, I, I was I was letting my hands go do you know what I mean there's like people people falling like here there and everywhere because there's a group of them um, and then it would just happen really quick and then I can remember going outside I seen seen one of my sister's friends I seen a scream I go what's up what's up what's up she's like your neck I'm like I'm looking at my neck like shit I'm bleeding and then I can remember like security coming over like, I want, like you've been stabbed and I'm like what man my neck is really bleeding she, he's like no you like your leg my leg was worse there's a lot of blood coming out of my leg um, and then obviously there's then you should go quite crazy and I'm trying to look for people and this and that and then yeah I'm in hospital next thing I remember my mum and dad are there crying all my boys are there um, my, my ex miss at the time is at home with a little baby thinking I want a night out it's just like just stuff you don't need to be happening and then I think I've gone back to GB and I've explained to Rob what was that like uh, that was my, yeah. my biggest fear you know, uh, I knew I was I knew I was gonna get like a, an earful, but a good earful. And basically, I can remember the conversation just going like, you know, like I've been there, I've been involved, like you know, I've been in situations and stuff like this over the years. You got to be a bit more selective about where you go. And it, and you know what, I've, I stuck with me. It's always stuck with me now. Like that place, it was it was my hometown. I didn't need to be there, but when you are there and you're a big guy and people know, know what you do and it was it was people's chance for a little moral victory over me. Do you know what I mean? And like a little victory over me in 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 a small town in a small city like Burton and Derby, small town, small city. It goes a long way. Do you know what I mean? Like you've done this to such and such. Um, but I can remember yeah, speaking to him and he just said, look, like, like you know, look at disappointment in his face. Like why are you getting into that, that sort of place? Why are you out drinking? Why are you out on late nights? Like you know, big year coming up the next year or whatnot. Do you know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, stern word and, and some good advice. And how did that change you? Yeah, yeah, like I seen a I seen a couple of guys involved with this probably a m couple of months later, and uh, at the time I think I was I think I think I was still like a bit I think I was on it, you know. So they're going like let's go and let's go, mm -hmm. you know, revenge sort of thing. And then after a conversation with them and, and just I think I think I, I think if I remember rightly, one of them just sort of said like, listen, like we ain't gonna fight you, mate, like you get the same treatment again. And I just thought, I'm in a fight, I can't win it. I can't beat these people. They're willing to do a lot more than I am. Do you know what I mean? If it, if it was a case of like, come down to the club tomorrow, we'll put some gloves on, we'll sort it out. I probably would have probably would have done it, but people that are willing to go jail or willing to, willing to, you know, willing to, to, to do bad things to me. I had, a little, I had a little daughter, man. She's so precious. And I just thought, you know what? I'm not even going to fucking... I'm not gonna, there's nothing I could do. Couldn't have done nothing. Hold my hands up. These these people are just like they're naughty people. Do you know what I mean? So I just had to take that out. Mm. How did that affect your boxing? Like how how long did oh, it take yeah, you? Oh yeah, took to... me a, took me a while. Mate, more more my neck healed up. You know, thank God it didn't uh, touch wood. It didn't touch like get me anywhere bad. Obviously, I had a hole in my neck, but more of a long slash. Mm. Uh, but my leg was my leg was bad. You know, like uh, took me a, took me a while, probably a six months. Mm. Did you ever think in that period of time about not boxing, or was it always no, just like no, get back and no. focus on this? Now no, like, the, the, just the, kind of bring things into focus, I'd imagine. Yeah, the pe like I, I tell you, the people at G I, I can't. I always go back to it. the people at GB Boxing, the Saints, like got me the best treatment, the best rehab. You know, um, whatever I needed, they helped me. You know, like to, to fix my injuries. So I can just remember, like you know, even even other injuries that I had, bad injuries. These people. They care, and they went above and beyond and looked after me, so I was able to make a full recovery. What do you think you'll do when you finish boxing? Boxing. I was going to say, you, yeah. stri you don't no, strike no. me as somebody who would leave the industry. No, I, I, coaching, I, I, back to GB, maybe? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, that would happen at some point. But I'm in it for life now. Um, you know, providing... The, the plan is to, to secure myself, secure my, my... Secure myself financially and to secure my future in the sport, whether that's helping others, coaching, uh, maybe doing a bit of punditry with Sky or whoever, you know, 
Um, but the planet, I love, I love this. It's, I live and breathe it. Um, I love, I love helping other people involved in it because I know how hard it can be, and I've, I'm picking up experience all the time. I'm quite experienced, and I, and I think I come across half knowledgeable, and I'm, but I'm still picking that up. And obviously, everyone needs to earn money, so you know, it's like if I can stay, if I can stay in in the sport, it's what I love. It's my passion. Still. I still watch Roy Jones video Roy Jones videos, you know, the can't be touched video every other day on on YouTube. I still watch Mike Tyson knockouts. I watch the best of Marvin Hagler, um, you know, Chavez, uh, Marquez, Pacquiao. I, I'd watch all these videos religiously, you know, the people Floyd Mayweather, Ricky Hatton. I just watch all their like knockouts just religiously. It's what I do. I love the sport. So I'm in it for life. What is the the kind of the end goal for you? Because I mean, like obviously, everyone wants to become a world champion. Mm -hmm. from when you kind of maybe not always from the first time you pick up the gloves. But once you start taking it seriously, everyone wants to become a world champion. Is it world champion or is it securing the gen the next generation behind you, getting the bag, so to speak? Or is it you know ideally everyone you know would have both? But if you had one to choose, which one would it be? Oh, fuck yeah, I want to be a world champion. A world champion, you know, like. I'll be able to look back at my career, you know, if I become a world champion and pick up other titles on the way, the British, European, Commonwealth, world title, if I can look back and I've got them, obviously with that, I think the bag comes, If you, if you, you, and you have to look after the bag as well because how many boxers do we know that, that ain't got nothing to show from, you know, really good careers, a lot of it, lots of them. Um, but yeah, world champion, like, and I've, I've had this conversation with other people, like, people, how far do you think you can go? You just never know, but I'll tell you what, I've got a knack of getting what I want in life. I've got a real bad knack of it. Like, I might not be pretty, it might take time, it might not set the world alight, it might set the world alight, but I will get what I came for. And that is to be a household name, a world champion, and to be someone that gives other people hope, kids hope. Um, I, I'm always going to, I'm always going to be the guy that's sat in the pub and you can have a conversation with me and approach me. I'm always gonna be the person that will go to schools and, and try and inspire other kids, you know, just tell them my experiences. I'll always be the guy that's got time for people. I don't, I'd like to think I'm never gonna be too big for my boots or, or become arrogant. And I've got a really good group of friends around me that and a good family that'll make sure that never happens. So, you know, just just, just get, get, what I, get what I deserve and what I work hard for. And obviously, we we're nothing without the bag. The bag the bag goes a long way in life. So yeah, there you go. Do you pay much attention to people's go? Because like it's kind of become a more I think a recent thing where people are like ah oh, he's British level at best or he's mm. European level at best. Like it's easy to just rock up and win a British title or win a European title. Does that stuff bother you? Do you kind of you seem to have a good way of kind of compartmentalizing, I guess. But you wouldn't be, and I know I've seen you nibbling and in the comments and stuff like that with yeah, people yeah, yeah. in the past. No. I know you can kind of, it kind of galvanizes you a little bit. But do you kind of do you, do you pay much attention to it? Is it something that you've had to kind of? I mean, the Fabio Wardley inc incident was kind of mm. a, a good example of you having to deal with something like that in order to move on. How do you how do you deal with it all? I did. I did pay, I did pay quite a bit of attention to it probably before, but I've become, I've, I've become a rock. I've become like, I've become solid in here. Do you know what I mean? I've become like, listen, look around you. you you're doing all right. You're doing well. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of fighters, a lot of heavyweight fighters would, would give a, a left nut to be in my shoes. Do you know what I mean? So I can't be doing too bad. And people are entitled to their opinions. And I let people have their opinions, don't get me wrong. But the thing is, if people take it to another level and start getting personal, like people speak about my kids, but like people speak about my family. If if that happens, or people just try to come and be like daft insults to me, like personal insults. If that happens, then it's fine. But if I, if I see you, I'm I'm just straight, I'm I'm straight up up to you and the only really way I know to handle things is the same as the kid that we talked about that was on the part before. If you see another kid and he's giving you jip or you have not ever you're having a back and forth, then you get a slap in the mouth or you get a punch on the nose. It's like it just comes as standard. And I know you I know I can't walk around doing that in our days, but I, the the least you'll get from me is a is a you know you, you you've been talking a lot like whatever you got to say to me say it like here and now, do you know what I mean? Let me hear you, let me have a conversation with you. And if it becomes a thing where people wanna attack me personally, 
then I just defend myself. But um, in terms of the comments and all that now, yeah, like I say, like I've become stone cold. Is that what we saw with uh, Prince Patel? That um, wasn't something I ever anticipated seeing. Listen, like I don't know, I don't really know the guy. I really got a problem with the guy. He's he's trying to get a few views. He's he's, he's clung on to me for some reason. Fat Fraser Clark. Well, yeah, dude, I'm a bit <laughs> fat, mate. I have got a tits. I have got more hair on my back than I've got on my head. And in my ears, in my arse, like, yeah. Say your worst, you know what I mean? But if you see me and you catch me on the wrong day, you you might get you might get your yeah, your hair your hair pulled and, and tickled up the side of your ribs. Uh play with feathers, get your ass tickled. Exactly. As they say. Okay, well, I think we're probably about there, phrase. I mean, again, I don't know if we are or we're not, but we, we, it was kind of a one-on-one uncut or one-on-one unplanned, but it's been always a pleasure to catch up with you, and uh, thanks very much for, for coming into ID Towers. Um, it's nice, mate. I like it. I like it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, stay tuned for more developments. And, uh, yeah, as always, real pleasure catching up. Thanks very much. Well, we're going to well. do some real fun bits now, Let's go. Uh, some light-hearted stuff. But thanks very much. And thanks to you guys for joining us here on One on One with the one and only Big Phrase, Phrase Clark. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and we'll catch up with you next time. I, I just want to be that prospect that everyone's like, he's coming. He's on his way. I knew to unlock my full potential, I could never coach and fight. The true test kicks in of, are you going to be able to do it? The aim is just to keep improving, keep grinding. You hit me, I'm going to get you back immediately. If anything, people should be more fearful because it's not about just landing one and I'm done. I'm still there and it's still a fight. In the same round, you could reach your demise. But it would seem to me like a good way to kind of, I guess, get in the slipstream would be to dip your toe back into the influencer side of things. Bullying. It's bullying for me to go and fight over there. Do you think that's what Tommy Fury's done? I have to go over to that side. That's the only choice you got left because I'm going to shut your career down before you even get to the titles of this division. I'm just for that.